Welcome to Saturday night. Let me remind you, there is a small group that meets immediately after we get through tonight uh, with uh, Brother Ron, uh, meeting next door across the, the driveway in the garage. Oh, we'll get you. We'll get you taken care of. You know, you guys, if you want to, you could stay in here and meet if you don't, unless you just want to go over there. It's up to you. Y'all figure it out. Uh, and then, of course, tomorrow, uh, 10 o'clock, as we're worshiping, there will be uh, Children's Church and the small groups following that uh, at 11 o'clock. Text tonight, Romans chapter 9. Follow along with me, if you would, beginning in verse 6. But it is not as though the word of God has failed, for not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel, and not all are children of Abraham because they are his offspring. But through Isaac shall your offspring be named. This means that it is not the children of the flesh who are the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as offspring. But this is what the promise said about this time next year. I will return and Sarah shall have a son. And not only so, but also when Rebekah had conceived children by one man, our forefather Isaac, though they were not yet born and had done nothing, either good or bad, in order that God's purpose of election might continue, not because of works, but because of him who calls, she was told, the older will serve the younger, as it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. Father, we ask you tonight, speak to our hearts, Lord, to speak to our minds as we continue to explore the riches of your word. Come to a text tonight, Father, that troubles many people. But Lord, there's really no trouble here if we will just hear Paul's argument. I pray that we would do that and that, Lord, we would indeed be humbled because we are encountering the most humbling of all truths that apart from your grace and your mercy apart from you operating in our lives we would never want you father thank you in jesus name we pray amen one of the more popular means of communicating cultural commentary today is by this little thing we call the meme by the way, the king of memes is sitting right here on the front row. If uh, you guys have ever seen some of the nonsense that Heath does, you'll understand why we call him the king of memes. Well, well, some of you may not know what a meme is. Let me give you a definition for a meme. A meme is a virally transmitted image embellished with text, usually sharing pointed commentary on cultural symbols, social ideas, or current events. And you go, huh? Let me give it to you another way. A meme is a picture with a statement that resonates with you. That's a meme. You see it, you go, ah, I like that. You share it, it spreads, and people are influenced. One of the more iconic memes over the last decade is a meme of Morpheus from The Matrix. Some of you don't know who Morpheus is or The Matrix. Lawrence Fishburne played the character Morpheus in the movie Matrix. Matrix is one of my top ten movies of all time. The, the meme has Morpheus in his seriousness with his round, dark glasses on, and the statement, what if I told you? And then some unusual thing that goes, makes you go, ah, yeah, I get that, I like that. Let me tell you a couple of my favorite ones that have been on the Morpheus meme. What if I told you that you can eat without posting it to Instagram? You understand that, don't you? Don't you love it when somebody says, my dinner tonight? Who cares? What if I told you you can actually eat? And you don't have to take a picture and share it with the world. Or this one. What if I told you the left lane is for passing, not camping? Everybody understand that one? Thought you might. Well, here's one. If you, if you know Matrix... Here's one that you'll like. What if I told you 
that I never actually said, what if I told you? You know why? Because in the movie, he never said that. That is what we call an infamously misquoted line. Nevertheless, I will tell you this, it is a very good line because it invites you, it challenges you to rethink what you think you know. By the way, we all need to be challenged with what we think we know. Uh, most of us have a propensity to be a know-it-all. That is, you can't tell us anything, we already know it. You know why we know it? We saw it on Facebook or Instagram, that's why we know it. I've entitled this message tonight, What If I Told You? Because in Romans chapter 9, verses 6 and 7, Paul gives us what I believe to be a what if I told you moment. Listen to what he says in verses 6 and 7. I read through verse 13, but we're really only going to focus on verses 6, 7, and 8 to, uh, this week. But look at verses 6 and 7. It is not as though the word of God has failed. For not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel. And not all are children of Abraham simply because they're Abraham's offspring. What Paul just said there in Morpheus fashion is this. What if I told you that not all of Israel is really Israel? Or what if I told you that just because you descend from Abraham does not actually make you Abraham's child or a child of God? And to put it in 21st century terms, it, it could be said like this. What if I told you that just because you've been baptized and you're a member of a church doesn't mean you're actually a Christian. Now, doesn't that stop you in your tracks? Doesn't that get you atten your attention? Told you. What if I told you might just change your life? What Paul is doing here is he is answering the question, what about Israel? So let's look at this tonight two major points I want to make. Number one, I want you to look with me at what I call Paul's categorical assertion. A categorical assertion is one that is unambiguous, that is explicit, that is direct. There's no doubt about it. And here's what he says in verse 6. It is not as though the Word of God has failed. In essence, what he is saying is God's Word is not failing. It has not failed. Fail. Let me remind you of the context that, that, that brings this about. Romans 9, 10, and 11. The context is Romans chapter 8 and Paul's message of assurance. Specifically, Romans 8, 28, where he has given us this definitive statement of assurance, whereby he says, for those who love God, for those who have been called according to his purpose, and he spells out what he means by purpose in the verses surrounding it, the purpose of God for your life is for you to be like Jesus. That's why you're, you're saved to be like Jesus. You're called to follow Christ. For those who love him and for those who are called according to that purpose, all things that you go through work together for good. All things. It doesn't matter what they are or how horrible they are or how good they are or what in between they are. It all works together for good. That is, God finishes what he starts. If he sets you on the road to salvation, he's going to get you all the way home. Your response to that is naturally going to be, well, of course that's true. That's obvious. We know that, right? Well, actually, if you understand the audience Paul is writing to in the church at Rome, it's not so obvious to them. And the reason it's not so obvious is because of something in the background of the story of redemption. And that something in the background is this. God made promises to Israel. And yet, in the day in which Paul is writing, the vast majority of Israel has rejected promises of God. In fact, they've rejected Messiah, and they are in unbelief. They are what we would call lost. So the question that naturally comes when Paul writes about those being called according to his purpose, because Israel would certainly say, we've been called according to God's purpose. For those who love God, and Israel would certainly say, well, we love God. If all things work together for good, but yet we're in unbelief, what about Israel? How, how do we explain that? What are we going to do with that? Paul, what about Israel? Now, just so we are clear, 
let me show you something about verse 6 that is frequently overlooked that you've got to grasp to really understand Paul's argument here. Notice in verse 6 the phrase, the Word of God. It is not as though the Word of God has failed. The first thing we need to reckon with is what Paul means when he uses that phrase, Word of God. You say, well, isn't that obvious? It's God's Word. Oh, no, we've got to be a little more specific than that. Wait, listen, is the Old Testament God's Word? Yes. Is the New Testament God's Word? Are the promises to God, are Israel God's Word? Is the Gospel God's Word? All right, what are we talking about here? It really does matter. The phrase Word of God can mean more than one thing. When it's used in the New Testament, that phrase is usually a reference to the Gospel. So that when Paul uses the phrase Word of God, it sometimes comes into English as God's Word, but the same words are there. Usually, the rule is that's a reference to the Gospel. Let me give you a couple of examples. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, I'm sorry, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 17. In 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 17, Paul is defending his apostleship. And in the 17th verse, he says this, For we are not like so many peddlers of God's word, but as men of sincerity, as commissioned by God, in the sight of God, we speak in Christ. Paul says we are not like so many in this day, peddlers of God's word. Peddlers of the gospel. Peddlers of the... That is, we come and preach to you about Jesus and, and you pay us. Or we have this great television ministry to raise all this money so we can have yachts and mansions. And Paul said, that's not what we are. That's not what we're about. He's, he's referring to the gospel there. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. Let me give you, this is another one where Paul says, Remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, the offspring of David, as preached in my gospel for which I am suffering, bound with chains as a criminal, but the Word of God is not bound. Word of God in that, that phrase, in that passage, is also a reference to the gospel. In fact, Paul defines what he means by Word of God in verse 8 there. Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, offspring of David, preached in my gospel. I am bound, suffering, but the Word of God, the gospel I proclaim, is not bound. All right. That's what we usually, when we see the, the phrase in English, the Word of God, in the New Testament, it usually, almost always, is synonymous with the gospel. There are two exceptions that I'm aware of where that phrase does not mean the gospel. It's not a reference to the gospel. There's, there, in other words, there's an exception to the rule. The first one is found in the gospel of Mark chapter 7. I want to read verses 11, 12, and 13 to you. By the way, the parallel to that in Matthew chapter 15, verse 7, also uses the phrase. But listen to Mark chapter 7, verses 11, 12, and 13. Jesus is chastising the Pharisees because they have taken the Word of God and they have twisted it to serve their purpose. Listen to what he actually says. But you say, if a man tells his father or his mother, whatever you would have gained from me is Corban, that is, given to God then you no longer permit him to do anything for his father or mother, thus making void the word of God by your tradition that you've handed down and many such things you do. There, word of God does not refer to the gospel. It's quite obvious he's not talking about the gospel. He's talking about something specifically promised to Israel. You've taken the word of God, the promises of God, you've twisted them so that they no longer apply to you. The other occurrence of Word of God where it's not a reference to the gospel is right here in Romans chapter 9, verse 6. It is not as though the Word of God has failed, for not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel. Here in Romans 9, 6, Paul is not using the Word of God as a reference to the gospel. He's referring to promises already made to Israel, not the gospel. He's not saying here the gospel is not as if the gospel's failed. That's not what he's talking about. It's not as if God's promises to Israel have failed. Now, one other thing. The, the, the actual verb failed there. The verb tense is really important because the verb tense gives us a little more insight as to the heart of Paul's message here. This is, in, in, the, in, the, in the Greek language, what we, what we call the perfect tense. The perfect tense in Greek is something that happens in the past 
But, the, but what happens in the past continues to have an active effect right up to the point that you're talking about. So that when he says here, in this passage, it's not as if the word has, got, has failed. When we actually take the verb tense into account, it's going to sound something like this. It is not as though the word of God, that is the promise to Israel, failed in the past, and it's not failing now. Now that's really important because Paul is facing arguments concerning God's faithfulness, God's dependability, the assurance of God's promise and His God's word and His word, in light of the fact that Israel seems to have failed, or at least God's word had failed them. And Paul says, "No, that is absolutely not the case. God has God has not failed anywhere in the past. His word is not failing even as I speak. God's word, God's promise to Israel, must be trustworthy." if the gospel is going to be trustworthy. Do you understand why that's so? Because it is a reflection on the character of God. If God cannot be trusted with promises he, promises he made to his people, Israel, what makes you think you can trust promises you read in the New Testament? How do you know God's not going to change? You say, well, I just know God doesn't change. Well, how do you know that? You had things in your life where you, it makes you wonder where God is? I bet you have. Did God change? See, it's really easy in the experiences and circumstances of life to get all twisted and confused. And if you're not anchored to an absolute truth, you're going to drift and crash and maybe even perish. It's absolutely essential that believers today be grounded in the absolute truth of God's Word and His promises. And there's nothing more important about the promises of God than the promises that touch upon salvation. So understand why this is important for us today. Listen to how John Piper put this. I like this. Israel is God's chosen people, and most of them are perishing, cut off from the Savior, Jesus Christ. And the reason it is a crisis for you and not just for the Jews is that if God's promise to Israel do not hold true, then there's no reason to think his promises to you will hold true. The rock-solid security of God's elect in Romans 8 is worthless if God proves unfaithful to his covenant people. God does not keep his promises to Israel. Will he keep the promises he makes to you? I hope I got you thinking a little tonight because Paul's about to give us one of those what if I told you moments that should make you really think. Now remember, he loves his fellow Jews. He does. He is a Jew who has become a believer. He wants them all to follow Christ. Just out of curiosity, do you love your friends? Do you want them to follow Christ? How badly do you want them to follow Christ? Paul said he was willing to be damned to an eternity in hell if it would mean his kin would follow Christ. So we know he loves his people, but we also know he loves the truth. In fact, he loves his people so much he will tell them the truth. We've gotten that backwards in the 21st century. We think if we really love somebody, we don't want to tell them the truth if it's going to hurt them. Oh, no, no, let's, let's wait and let the truth blindside them and really hurt them. Right? So if you really want to hear the truth, if somebody loves you enough to tell you the truth, you ought to appreciate it even if it hurts. And some of what you may hear in this message tonight has the potential to really hurt. But I want you to know it's the truth. Paul reminds them of the truth of who they are. To them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the law, the worship, the promises, the patriarchs. From them comes the Messiah, the Christ. Yes, they are privileged, and yet in their privilege they've rejected Christ. They're lost. So, has God failed? Is God's faithfulness in doubt? Paul's categorical assertion is absolutely not. No, God's word has not failed. Well then, Paul, how do you square God making promises to Israel and yet Israel rejecting the promises? Are you sure there's not a problem? So Paul takes his audience by the hand, and he walks them through the greatest what if I told you of all times. That's his categorical assertion. God hasn't failed. His word hasn't failed. Now, the second thing I want you to see tonight is how we know that. And that's what I want to call Paul's comprehensive proof. 
Look at verse 6, the first part of verse 7, the first part of verse 8. It is not as though the word of God has failed. For not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel. And not all who are children of Abraham, or not all are children of Abraham, because they are his offspring. Verse 8, it is not the children of the flesh who are the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as offspring. So here comes Paul's bomb. No God's promise, God's word has not failed. And let me tell you why. It's because not everybody who identifies as Israel is actually Israel. There are actually, you ready for this? Two Israels. Now, what in the world does that mean? And I assure you they were saying the same thing. So Paul gives it to us three different ways. He says, not all who were descended from Israel belong to Israel. Not all are Abraham's children just because they come from Abraham. And not all of the children of the flesh are children of God. Just because you're born of Abraham doesn't mean you're a child of the promise. Doesn't mean you're a child of God. So he repeats it three different ways. Just because you're in the lineage doesn't mean you're actually a part What's he saying? What's, it, what's his real point here? here? Here it is. He's saying that the covenant promises of God have always been fulfilled in a subset of the people of Israel. In, listen, in all of redemptive Israel, in, in all of redemptive history, God's covenant promise to Israel has never applied to all of Israel. It has never been fulfilled in such a way that every last Israelite was counted as a child of God. What that means is there's always been a remnant. Always been a remnant. By the way, that's how you explain a lot of Israel's history. Have you ever really wondered how in the world, if they're God's chosen people, how in the world did Israel, how in the world did the northern, kings, in northern kingdom actually cease to exist? 8th century Assyrians come in, and man, they just, there is no more Israel. I thought they were God's people. Southern kingdom, 130 years later, Babylonian captivity. How in the world do you explain that so many died? I thought they were God's people. Their history is explained by this very concept Paul is talking about. By the way, this is not the first time he said this. The end of chapter 2. Listen to what he said. For no one is a Jew who is merely one outwardly, nor is circumcision outward and physical. A real Jew is one inwardly. Circumcision is a matter of the heart, by the spirit, not by the letter. His praise is not from man, but from God. He's saying the exact same thing. Here's our problem. We don't pay attention. You know why we don't pay attention? Because we think we already know. You notice somebody starts to tell you something you already know. You don't listen because you already know it. And then what they actually tell you is a little bit different, but you don't pick up on it. You know why? Because you already know it. So what if I told you you didn't actually know? By the way, Christians in 21st century America have this problem to the nth degree. We simply don't pay attention to God's Word. We have allowed certain traditions and cultural preferences to replace the truth of God's Word rather than actually listening to God's Word. So what's Paul really wanting us to see here? Is he really wanting us to wrestle with the concept of two Israels? As a matter of fact, yes, he is. Because it applies to us today as well. So who are the two Israels? The external Israel, the internal Israel. The external Israel is the, is the physical descendants of... Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, coming through Jacob. They're Israel in name. They love the rituals. They go through the motions. They're very religious people. That's one Israel, the external Israel. The second one is the internal Israel, the true Israel, the spiritual Israel. The Israel that truly trusts in the living God, who rests in His promises and enjoy the blessings of salvation. Here's what Paul is getting at. It doesn't matter if you're a physical descendant of Abraham. It doesn't matter if you're physically an Israelite if your heart hasn't been changed. Just because who you are genealogically doesn't carry favor with God when it comes to salvation. 
great Puritan John Flavel put it this way, if Abraham's faith be not in your hearts, it will be no advantage that Abraham's blood runs in your veins. Yes, to Israel's, the external, what you see, and the internal, the true believers. Now, does that kind of take you off guard a little bit? Does it surprise you a little bit? Does it confuse you a little bit? Does it bother you a little bit? See, if you answer no to all of those, one of two things is true. You've really paid attention and you understand the redemptive scheme of God and you've never questioned how God operates. Or, the second thing, which I think is more, most likely, you already know it and you're not listening and paying attention. Because if you really understand what Paul is saying, you're going to go, wait a minute, let me think about this. Jesus, by the way, said the very same thing. Let me show you where he said it. Probably in the Gospels, my favorite chapter in all the Gospels is John chapter 8. In John chapter 8, we have what I really believe is a Donnybrook between Jesus and the Pharisees. The Pharisees, the, understand who they are. They're the religious leaders. If we had Pharisees in the church today, oh, wait a minute, we do. Never mind. The Pharisees were like the leaders, the staff and the deacons, you know, the ones who were in charge and run things. No, no, not in our church. We run this church. Yeah, are you the Pharisees then? They're arguing about who Jesus is. Beginning in verse 33 and through verse 44 is some of the best reading you're going to read about Jesus putting people in their place. Beginning in verse 39, listen to this. They answered him, these are the Pharisees, Abraham is our father. Jesus said to them, if you were Abraham's children, you would be doing the works of Abraham, the works that Abraham did. But now you seek to kill me, a man who has told you the truth that I heard from God. This is not what Abraham did. You are doing the works of your fa that your father did. They said, we were not born of sexual immorality. By the way, that was a slam at Jesus. We have one father, even God. Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you would love me. For I came from God, and I am here. I came not of my own accord, but he sent me. Why do you not understand what I say? It is because you cannot bear to hear my word. You are of your father, the devil, and your will is to do your father's desires. Now, it, it, it's really good through the rest of the chapter, but I'm just going to stop right there. Do you get what Jesus just said in verse 44? He's talking to descendants of Abraham. The Pharisees are descended from Abraham. They are descended from Abraham, Isaac, through Jacob. All of them come from one of the tribes that is Israel. Jesus just said basically, yes, you're descendants of Abraham, but your father is the devil. You might be of Israel, but you are not Israel. So Jesus, in this confrontation, points out the reality that there are two Israels. There are those in Israel in name only, and there are those who truly are believers. Not all Israel is Israel. Not all descendants of Abraham are children of God. It's not the flesh factor that matters. It's the promise factor. Romans 9, 8. This means that it is not the children of the flesh who are the children of God. It's the children of the promise who are actually counted as Abraham's offspring. Now, let's get a handle on this. I want you to understand this. The kingdom of God, practical implications of this, the kingdom of God is not inherited by physical descent. That means it doesn't matter who you are. Through the years, I have been blessed to be in churches where members have been there, their family, their family lineage in that church goes back several generations, so they believe that they are Christians because their great-great-great-grandparents were parts of that church. You ever encountered that? You talk about some devilish people. I have encountered some devilish people in that category. 
they are the modern equivalent of thinking they've inherited the kingdom because of who they are. Listen, the kingdom is not inherited by physical descent. It is not granted by external ritual. That means you don't become a believer simply because you followed the prescribed external rituals. For us, that would be baptism, church membership, going through the Lord, or using or participating in the Lord's table. Those things do not guarantee that you're actually truly a believer because the kingdom is not ritualistic. The kingdom is relational, and the relationship is a God thing. It is a sovereign God thing. Thing. Think about it. God chose Abram. Do you really know what Abram was when God called him? He was a Mesopotamian pagan who worshipped idols. He wasn't looking for God. He was worshipping gods. And I've heard this. I, somebody's even said this to me. Well, you, Pastor, you do know that God chose him because he saw what Abraham would do and he chose based on that. Where do you see that anywhere in Scripture? Show me where Scripture in any shape, form, or fashion says God foreknew what Abraham would do and therefore chose Abraham based on what Abraham would be, not what he was. That makes Abraham sovereign in his calling, not God. That is not what you see in Scripture in any shape, form, or fashion. In fact, if you really follow Romans 9, Paul demolishes that kind of thinking. God chose Abram. Then he chose Isaac, Abram's son, but he did not choose Ishmael, Abram's son. And let's be honest, if God were fair and did things according to the standard that men have said ought to happen, Ishmael would have been the chosen one. He was older. He had the right. God didn't choose him. And then from Isaac, the twins Jacob and Esau, God chose Jacob. If God were fair and operated on the traditions that we believe, Esau would have been the chosen one. He was firstborn. He had the right. But that is not what Paul tells us. Listen carefully. This is what the promise said. This is verse 9. About this time next year, I will return and Sarah will have a son. That's a reminder that God already has a son. or Abram already, Abraham already has a son, Ishmael. But God is passing by him. He's not choosing him. Verse 10, and not only so, but also when Rebekah had conceived children by one man, our forefather Isaac, though they were not yet born and had done nothing either good or bad, in order that God's purpose of election might continue, not because of works, but because of him, that is God who calls. She was told the older will serve the younger, as it is written, Jacob I loved, Esau I hated. Now, I'm going to spend next week telling you what verse 13 really is about. It's not what you think. Don't think of love and hate in the way you think of love and hate. So when Paul explains, which is what he's doing here, when he explains why it is that not all Israel is Israel, why it is that God's promises haven't come to bear on all of Israel, why it is that most of Israel have rejected him and only a few have believed, he goes right to the source, to the answer. And the answer he gives is this. It's all about God's choice, God's sovereign election. He actually uses that language. Now, yes, I understand that's, that's language that upsets us. Again, this is a difficult passage, but the thing that makes it difficult is our preconceived notions of what has to be. We think God has to operate a certain way. And the way we think he operates or should operate is under our concept of fairness rather than under the banner of who he is, the sovereign God. Look at verse 11 of this ninth chapter. Though they were not yet born and had done nothing either good or bad in order that God's purpose of election might continue. There, there it is. This is all about the purposes of God's election, what God does and why he does it. Listen, that's, that's why for Abraham, that's why for Isaac, that's why for Jacob, that's why for you, that's why for me. It's not, it's not about what you do. It's not about your works or your deeds. It's not about what you will or won't or might or should. It's about what God does. It's about God's choice. Phil Riken put it this way. He said, God chose Jacob to 
in order to teach the mystery of election that God is sovereign in dispensing his mercy. See, here's our problem. We don't want a God of mystery. We want a God we can explain. We want a God who answers to us. We want a God who does what we expect him to do. I got news for you. That is a God of your own imagination. That is a God of your creation. That's an idol. And most modern American Christians are idolaters. We don't worship the true God. We worship a God in our own image. Paul is shattering our images here. Riken goes on. God predestines those who will receive his sovereign grace, and Jacob was chosen for the very purpose of demonstrating that, that God's grace is God's choice. Now, let me ask you some questions I asked you just a few minutes ago. Does that bother you? Does that cause you to take a step back and go, uh, mm, I don't know. Doesn't seem fair to me. What about <clears throat> my free will? By the way, we're going to get to that. Not today, but we're going to get to that. That's part of this. So does it bother you a little bit? Listen, it's okay for you to say this bothers me a little bit because let me tell you, let me give you this shocker. It bothered Abraham too. Really? How do you know it bothered Abraham? Uh, well, have you actually ever actually paid attention to Genesis 17 when God reconfirms the covenant with Abraham that it's going to be not through Ishmael, which, by the way, is Abraham's handiwork. It's going to be through Isaac, who is God's handiwork. You understand what I mean by that? Those of you who really know the story, it's a perfect illustration of how we think God ought to operate according to our handiwork, not his. But if you actually look at Genesis 17, let's do it. Why not? Come on, I'll show you this. Let me see some, let me hear some pages turning. I don't hear any, oh, I, I can't hear pages turning when you're just flipping the screen, can I? Listen, listen to this. This is Genesis 17. We'll begin in verse 15. Verse 18 is the one we want to come to. But listen to get a little context, because this is what Paul is talking about in Romans 9, 9. This is the, the context of it. Genesis 7, 17, 15. God said to Abraham, as for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her name Sarai, but Sarah. That will be her name. I will bless her. Moreover, I will give you a son by her. I will bless her. She will become nations, kings of peoples, shall come from her. Then Abraham fell on his face and laughed and said to himself, Shall a child be born to a man who is 100 years old? Shall Sarah, who is 90 years old, bear a child? Now here's where I know God, what God is doing bothers him. Look at what he says in verse 18. And Abraham said to God, Oh, that Ishmael, Ishmael might live out before you. Oh, that Ishmael. You know what he's really saying there? God, why can't Ishmael be the one? Why can't we do it? Why can't Ishmael do it? Why, why can Ishmael not be the son of promise? It's bothering Abraham. Uh, Ishmael's 12, 10, 12 years old now. He loves his son. And in his mind, that would work. But you know what? What I think and what God thinks are usually two different things simply because God knows a little bit more than I do. And you ready for this? Don't be offended by this, but he knows a whole lot more than you do. It's God's way, not our way. That's the context of this quote in Romans 9, 9. The sovereign purposes of God on display. God says, I make the promise, I bring it to pass. My promises are not predictions of what might come with your help. My promises are declarations of what I will bring to pass by my power. And therein lies the difference. By the way, that's the, di the difference in redemption. Sarah's going to have a son. Old Abraham, bless his heart, 100 years old, going to have to change diapers. But this child's going to be a child of promise. That's the language that's used. What's a child of promise? A child of promise is an heir of God's saving grace by God's sovereign word, not physical birth. You know what that means? If you're here and you truly know Jesus, it means you're a child of promise. It means you're not a believer because of who you are. 
You're not a believer because of what your, who your mama was or your grandmama was. You're not a believer because of anything you've done. You're a believer because in God's grace, he brought you to himself. See, picture, Isaiah is a, or Isaac rather, is a picture of how every child of God comes spiritually into being. The decisive work of God. Not Abraham, not Isaac, not you, not me, but God. Now, I've been around the block a few times. I'm working on my 60th spin around this place. I have read, 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 preached, taught, worked through this for years. And I know this is uncomfortable for many of you. It seems to go against what you've always believed. That God voted for you, the devil voted against you, and now you're going to cast the winning vote on whose side you're going to be on. I assure you, if you're truly a believer, it didn't happen that way. Certainly not according to what Paul was teaching us here. God's purpose, God's choice, because he's God. Every possible human factor is excluded as the basis of why God does what he does. God's grace does not find its origins in us. His grace is compelled by something not that we do, but that he is. That's grace. Now, let me, let me close by making this extremely practical. It was a really huge error for the Jews of Paul's day, and not just of his day, but leading up to his day, to assume that because they are descended from Abraham that that gave them absolute security and absolute favor with God. If they had just paid attention to their own history, they would know something's wrong with that thought. By the way, that same error is being committed by so many today, and not just by those who are Jewish. It's being committed by many, many people who are Americans and many people who sit in churches every week. Being born American doesn't give you security or favor with God. We are finding that out today. Church membership does not mean that you are in a right relationship with God. Church membership doesn't save you. Ritual doesn't save you. Baptism didn't save you. You can be part of a visible community of faith, just as all within Israel were, and yet not have a heart for God. Not experience the saving work. Never really follow Christ. In other words, you weren't born a Christian. Baptism didn't make you a Christian. Sitting in church and embracing the promises of God, or at least giving consent to the promises of God, doesn't guarantee that you are heeding the warnings or not heeding the warnings. You might just very well be what the Jews were in Paul's day, a cultural believer, a cultural Christian for us. That's not a true Christian. You see, a true Christian believes trust in Christ. That, those are not just words. A Christian follows Christ. A Christian speaks for Christ, testifies to Christ. A Christian learns about Christ, actually actively engages. He wants to learn about Christ. You know what I see from at least half of people who are members of churches today? No active engagement in seeking to learn. No real interest in gathering to worship. No real speaking of Christ at all, unless it's part of a, a curse of some type. And yet, the claim is, I'm a Christian. And I would say, on what basis? Because you say so? The Jews thought they were right with God because of who they were, who they thought they were. What if I told you? What if I told you? Just because you use the words, it doesn't mean you know the word. Not everybody who is Israel, is Israel. Not everybody who says they're Christians really are.
Father, we thank you for the challenge that this word really is. Father, I pray that you would stun us with Paul's message here. Because the words that he wrote in the day that he wrote them did that very thing. It stunned his audience. Your word doesn't fail. Your promises don't fail. To the true Israel, you've never failed. But for those who just play the game, well, in their mindset, we're talking about something different. Oh, Lord, what if you told us that we really don't trust you? Some of the most chilling words Jesus ever spoke he spoke in wrapping up the Sermon on the Mount when he used those words, depart from me, I never knew you. Those who came swearing they believed were met with the harsh message, a hard message, depart, I never knew you. Father, speak to us today. In Jesus' name we pray.